Welcome, everyone, to the On Poly Podcast. I'm Steve Pakin. And I'm John Michael McGrath. Today on the pod, Bonnie Crombie's Big Week, making headlines on housing, climate, and tax policy, and a wish list for next week's Ontario budget. And uh, I talk a little bit about a phrase Bonnie Crombie's been using a lot lately. Hmm, wonder what that could be. It is March 22nd, 2024, so let's get to it. Hey, partner. Good to Hello, see you sir. again. Good to see you. Okay, we are going to start how we always start, it seems, because uh, we seem to have a continuation of themes from previous episodes of this podcast. Yes, indeed. Now, I recall for the last couple of weeks, you've been repping stuff having to do with the solar system. Yeah, whimsical, uh, scientific, star, space stuff. Yeah, yeah, dealing with planets. And I noticed today that you are riffing on that theme, but not quite. And it's in French. So maybe <laughs> for those who don't speak, you want to translate? Uh, yeah, so uh, this is uh, both a reference to a Magritte painting, uh, famously, the Sissi ne pas une pipe. Uh, this is not a pipe uh, painting, but it is also a Star Wars reference, Sissi ne pas une lune. This is not a moon, or more colloquially for those who remember Star Wars, that's no moon. Which Obi-Wan Kenobi said in episode four, A New Hope. Yes, when he saw the Death Star for the, the first Death time. Death Star, very good. Yes. Very Star Wars nerdy, perfectly on brand for John Michael McCarthy. Absolutely. I, on the other hand, am continuing the, uh, how will we say, the, the sort of geographic look at the province of Ontario, because last week I had on something that said Highway 69, yes. which is the highway you take to get from Toronto up through Perry Sound, eventually to Sudbury. And uh, you know how much I love Northern Ontario, so here we go again. 17 North. <laughs> which is the highway, I think it basically starts at Nipigon, goes west to North Bay, continuing along Dryden, and then eventually Kenora. So it's a, it, 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 right. it yes. sort of goes west and north through northwestern Ontario, and, uh, well, what's not to love here? So there we go. That is a part of the province I've never actually been to. Oh. I've never been to the, 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 the northwest. Got to go. Yeah. Thunder Bay, especially, Sleeping Giant, gorgeous. Just beautiful yeah. sun, sunrises. It is and definitely on my to-do list, but... You know. <laughs> okay, well, don't do it yet because we got a podcast to do. Oh, okay? yeah, okay. So let's get to that. <laughs> Issue one, here we go. Okay, the carbon tax and rebate plan. I'm calling it the carbon tax and rebate plan because it's not just a tax, it's also a rebate. You everybody, get some money back. Everybody forgets that. But yep. anyway, the carbon tax and rebate plan is, of course, a federal initiative of Justin Trudeau's government, but its political consequences have been percolating at Queen's Park for the past couple of weeks. Premier Doug Ford, as we know, has upped the rhetoric against the carbon pricing policy, and he's tried to squeeze the new Liberal leader, Bonnie Crombie, on the measure, in effect trying to force Crombie to publicly disagree with her federal leader. Mm -hmm. And for a while, it worked. Uh, Crombie's initial statements about what she'd do on this issue were not at all clear, but this week, significant clarification. The Ontario Liberals will strike a blue-ribbon panel of experts to offer advice on how the Grits should handle this issue if they ever get to form a government. And particularly noteworthy, Crombie has taken a future or potential carbon tax off the table. Okay, tell us more. So uh, this will be a panel chaired by the Beaches East York Liberal MPP, uh, Mary Margaret McMahon. Uh, she, let's jump right to, she did tell us uh, on Monday that the provincial liberals still support the federal liberals and want to see them reelected. And I mentioned that because, of course, this is only an issue if uh, Justin Trudeau uh, is or, or another carbon tax supporting uh, party forms government after the next election. Which is not Pierre Polyev's party. Precisely. And yes. he has been leading in the polls for uh, many months now. And the uh, so this this basic question is like, Will this policy still even exist uh, by the next provincial election? Because, of course, there has to be a federal election before the next provincial election. Um, if Crombie is not backing away from the federal Liberal Party, she is certainly backing away uh, from the uh, carbon tax uh, and more than just backing away, running. <laughs> Which we hasten to add she is legally allowed to do. Yes. I mean, all provinces are. The federal law says that a carbon tax only applies if there is no provincial climate change plan in place. And Crombie has said she is going to come up with her own climate change, carbon pricing, however you work it, plan. So th there's nothing illegal about what she said. I think we should establish that. Anyway, we're talking difference. Last week we were talking about differences between the federal and provincial conservatives, and there were some significant differences, and no love lost there on a few things. But here we are a week later talking about some significant policy differences between the federal liberals and provincial liberals. So. This all really is a reminder of one of my favorite expressions in politics, which is where you stand depends on where you sit. 
Yes. Very true. Anyway, here's what Bonnie Crombie had to say about all this at a press conference she had on Tuesday, this past Tuesday. I'm not here to tell them how to do their job. I'm here to create a plan that's right for Ontarians. And quite frankly, this is just another opportunity like Doug Ford is trying to distract from the fact that he doesn't have a plan. We are going to have a plan and it will be a very innovative plan. We will make polluters pay, but we won't add additional tax burden to Ontarians because they, we know they can't handle more taxes at this time. There's the Liberal leader from earlier this week. Now, let's circle back to the question of what Ontario is either obliged or not obliged to do, we have to keep in mind that Ontarians right now pay the federal carbon tax because Premier Doug Ford cancelled the previous government's Made in Ontario cap and trade plan. And that plan raised billions of dollars for the, Ontra uh, for the Ontario Treasury. So we got to remember, had that cap and trade plan not been cancelled by the current government, Ontarians would not be paying the carbon tax. That's on Premier Ford which is kind of ironic, no? Uh, yes, it, it, very much so. And, uh, you know, this is an issue where, you know, I, I think there's been some criticism of Crombie, as some people have, you know, asserted that, you know, she's she's pulling the Liberals away from climate policy. And that's a debatable proposition. I do think that, at least in principle, it is possible that uh, a... A, a liberal government or even before the next election, the liberal party could make a serious proposal that complied with the principles of the federal uh, climate plan um, that didn't necessarily involve a carbon tax, right? right? They, the the consumer-facing carbon tax is just one side of climate policy, and depending on who you ask, it, it may not even be uh, the one that's doing most of the work mm -hmm. in terms of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know... Um, Crombie's announcement this week doesn't necessarily uh, rule out uh, climate policy or even ambitious climate policy. Uh, she is just clearly sticking out what is not on the menu. Exactly. All right, on to issue two. Now, we're going to stay with the Liberals here because the party made several announcements this past week. This next one we'll talk about is about housing. It is called the Build Ontario Act. And BUILD is actually not only the name of the act, it's also an acronym. B-U-I-L-D. So yes. take us through it, JMN. Uh, so the Build Ontario Act, uh, BUILD stands for Building Universal and Inclusive Land Development. Mm -hmm. uh, and this would legalize four units or four plexes uh, on every lot in, it, that is already zoned for uh, residential homes in Ontario. And uh, it does this, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about legalizing housing. The way it would do this specifically is by uh, amending the Planning Act. And you know how I love to talk about the Planning Act. I do. Um, <laughs> uh, but basically it would restrict municipal powers so that they could not uh, impose some of the conditions that we have seen them use in the past uh, to uh, stall the uh, uh, application of, of new or the, the application for, for permits to build new homes. We like to give credit where it's due. And I guess we should therefore say that this sounds an awful lot like a plan that the Green Party of Ontario brought forward not too long ago. Uh, both bills, the Liberal one and the Green one, play with the idea of building quadplexes or fourplexes, whatever you want to call them, on residential lots by cutting a lot of red tape. Again, pick up the story if you would. Yeah, they, they both approach the same goal with uh, different, uh, slightly different strategies. And, um, you know, we, we know, uh, you can remember going back to, I want to say 2006 or seven, the Ontario Liberal government under Dalton McGuinty then brought in um, uh, policies to uh, allow basement suites uh, that mm -hmm. were supposed to be legalized all over Ontario. But what they found was, uh, in the face of provincial law, municipalities just um, said things like, well, okay, you can have a basement suite, but you have to put three parking spaces in if you do. And obviously nobody was going to do that. Defeats the purpose. Um, and so uh, that experience, I think, is informing uh, some of what we're seeing here where uh, people are proposing laws to really um, uh, take some of those tools away from municipalities. Um, we did reach out to Mike Schreiner because uh, this bill uh, really you know, has a, a similar aim. Uh, and uh, he uh, wrote back saying... Quote, I'm glad that the Liberals now see the benefits of legalizing housing, and I hope they will join me in pushing for more kinds of gentle density by adopting our calls for 6 to 11 stories on transit corridors as well. So we already we got some agreement on four stories, and Mike wants to raise the ceiling, so to speak. i got to say, that's a very Mike Schreiner kind of answer where um, he says, I did have a good idea, and I am happy to have you steal it if it kind of moves the... Uh, or advances the issue along. Now, uh, come to think of it, there's actually a lot of thievery going on yes. at Queen's Park these days because one of the interesting things about this liberal bill, just unveiled this week, 
is that it steals some of its ideas from the progressive conservative government's own housing task force. And I'm trying to think now, who rejected some of the ideas that were in the progressive conservative's own housing task force? Uh, that would be the progressive conservative government That's itself. That's right. I think you're <laughs> right about that. Yeah. Yeah, so the task force brought its report forward uh, just before the 2022 election, and the government wasn't going to, um, let's say, uh, demonstrate the uh, conviction of uh, uh, this potentially unpopular idea uh, right before an election, uh, but they also haven't really done anything with it since. Um, and so uh, the premier uh, clearly believes that this idea is uh, too controversial. Uh, homeowners and municipalities as well uh, don't like the idea of having these powers uh, taken away from them. Uh, in fact, we know this is the case because the premier was asked about uh, Crombie's uh, proposal uh, on Thursday at a press conference in Richmond Hill, uh, made it very clear that uh, the government will not be considering this. Well, I, I can tell you one thing. You know, I, I heard that uh, announcement from uh, Bonnie Crombie, and I can assure you 1,000%, you go in the middle of communities and start putting up four-story, six-story, eight-story uh, buildings, and right deep into the communities, there's going to be... Uh, there's going to be a lot of shouting and screaming. That's a massive mistake. We we are not going to go into communities and build four-story or six-story uh, buildings beside residents like this. It's uh, it's it's off the table for us. Well, uh, the government has railed against so-called NIMBYs, not in my backyard, uh, getting in the way of new homes built. But uh, in that clip, the premier seems to be siding with the NIMBYs, while at the same time, I think in fairness, we should say, offering significant incentives as well yes. to municipalities to get homes built. So on the one hand, on the other hand, what's going on here? Yeah, we'll talk about the incentives in a minute. But, uh, you know, we've seen this uh, tug of war within the government uh, for some time now. Uh, I mean, certainly you could trace this line going well back before the last election, where uh, there are uh, people, I mean, we mentioned the task force, but also um, people like uh, Tim Hudak at the Ontario uh, Real Estate Association, who a former PC party leader, um, not, you know, uh, uh, not an enemy of this government by any means. But uh, they put out a report earlier uh, this year also uh, arguing for legalizing fourplexes. And um, there are definitely people within the party and, and within the broader conservative movement who want to see the government move on this. But uh, clearly, the premier is listening to, uh, let's say, more um, cautious uh, voices uh, who uh, uh, are worried about uh, the, the very reasonable prospect of uh, voters uh, not being happy with the sight of lots of new homes going up in, in otherwise stable neighborhoods. Understood. All right, on to issue three. Well, yesterday morning we had dueling news conferences. At 9 a.m., both the Premier and a few of his cabinet ministers went up to Richmond Hill... And the Liberal leader and her finance critic all made announcements related to next Tuesday's annual Ontario budget. Let's touch on Doug Ford's announcement first. He's announced $1.8 billion in funding for municipalities to help build infrastructure to help support home building in the province. Altogether, our government is investing $3 billion in housing enabling infrastructure. And I think that's that's probably the, the most I've ever heard in the history of this province. $3 billion to help municipalities like Richmond Hill get shovels in the ground to build more homes. Doug Ford in Richmond Hill. Okay, we got some pretty big numbers there. You yes. want to go into some of the details? So we have $1 billion uh, that will be dedicated to a new municipal housing infrastructure program, uh, and then more than half billion dollars for what they are calling the Housing Enabling Water Systems Fund. Um, you know, one of my little rules of covering provincial politics is that uh, – if you want to talk about a significant announcement, the threshold is a billion dollars or more. Mm -hmm. Anything less than that might be interesting. It might be important. It might be a very worthwhile Canadian initiative. <laughs> uh, but if you want to talk about significant policy change, for me, I would say the floor starts at a billion dollars. And this qualifies. This is, uh, you know, nearly two billion dollars in money. Um, in terms of the details of the policy, I think, you know, um, 
I, I think I've said this before on the podcast, people need to remember that uh, a house is not just four walls and a roof. It is connected to all sorts of infrastructure uh, that it, it needs to be connected to, right? Water, sewer, electricity, roads. And uh, if you don't have those uh, connections or if those connections are delayed or if the costs of those uh, infrastructure projects get passed on to uh, new home builders and potentially customers for those new homes, uh, that can stall uh, home building. It can make home building more expensive. Expensive. So the fact that the government is uh, proposing to pay for this stuff out of it seems to be general revenues that we don't have a ton of details on mm -hmm. this program yet. Uh, Two billion dollars, you know, that could get a lot of uh, sewer and water projects built. Um, and it's, it's specifically being targeted to places where, uh, you know, there are. Uh, approved developments waiting for the sewers to get built, the water pipes to get filled, that kind of thing. So it should be a game changer. Well, you know, should it, be. It, 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 Here's hoping. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> we, you know, I, I don't think we can overstate just how dire the housing crisis is and the need to really get those shovels in the ground. Um, you know, the, the last year of housing starts in Ontario has been kind of underwhelming. And uh, so uh, two billion is good. I think a lot of people would tell you that uh, you probably need to bring that up even further. Well, let's see what next Tuesday's budget has to say about <laughs> yes, all indeed. of that. Anyway, the Liberals responded to that announcement by the PCs pretty quickly, though, didn't they? Uh, they did, um, because, of course, uh, when Doug Ford did, at this press conference, uh, rule out the uh, uh, the, the idea of fourplexes everywhere, uh, the Liberals uh, sent out a, a news release responding to it saying, quote, this is a NIMBY government that only cares about looking out for their rich friends and well-connected insiders. Ouch. <laughs> yeah, no, tough talk. Tough uh, talk. You yeah. know, um, one of those things that uh, you see a lot in in politics is, is you, you know, the speed with which somebody can throw the counter punch is <laughs> something that that I I, I watch for and. Uh, the, the Liberals not uh, not letting that one wait too long. Well, Ford and Crombie are both scrappers, so we'll see more of this to come, I'm sure. Uh, in the meantime, Bonnie Crombie did hold her third news conference of the week, uh, as we suggested, yesterday morning, 9 o'clock in the morning. Alongside her was Stephanie Bowman, the MPP for Don Valley West, the finance critic for the Liberals, and they were laying out some of their ideas uh, for what they want to see in next Tuesday's budget. Let's have a look. Our agenda is based on a simple acceptance of abundance. And we will achieve our vision through strong action to attract jobs and through careful stewardship of the budget. We do not see that strong action with this Conservative government. We do not see careful management of the budget either. Instead, we see dithering and delays, failures and flip-flops and scandals. Now, Crombie noted that when she was the mayor of Mississauga, she never ran <laughs> deficits. Yes. While that is true, we should remind everybody that no municipality is allowed by law to run a deficit. So, yes, it's true, but come on. <laughs> yes. Okay, pick uh, up the story again, if you would. It, Doug Ford has also never declared war on another country, <laughs> something he does not have the power to do. So <laughs> That is true. <laughs> so, yes. Um, but this was, you know, an opportunity for uh, Bonnie Crombie to, uh, you know, make sure that the Liberal Party got its uh, foot in the door for the budgetary news cycle. We know that the budget is coming next Tuesday, and uh, it's natural that the government is going to suck up a lot of the oxygen for a few news cycles. And this was uh, an opportunity for the Liberals to say, well, actually, here's what we want to see uh, in the uh, budget. They had already announced a, um, a tax measure that they, uh, this was the day before, uh, they announced a tax measure for um, uh, recreation, basically a tax break for families, a non-refundable tax credit for things like kids sports and music lessons and, and those kinds of extracurriculars. Do you remember the last government in this country that brought forward an idea like that? I mean, to me, it sounded like a very Stephen Harper thing. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, this is what's so hilarious about so many of these policies. You know, we think there are these magnificent differences among the party stripes. And in fact, this is a pure ripoff from something Stephen Harper brought in when he was conservative prime minister of Canada. Well, I mean, it was also extremely popular. It was, Stephen for Harper. sure. So, yeah. you know, it, don't uh, knock the liberals for chasing um, popular policy, I'm I guess. Not <laughs> I'm not knocking the politics of it, uh, but uh, I'm just, you know, I think I've said it before. There's nothing new under the sun. And when liberals start stealing policies from conservatives, I notice. That's yes, all. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Anyway, anything else on this? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think it's an interesting uh, example of... Um, you know, I, I'm not a huge fan of these like boutique tax credits. Um, I, I think that uh, it, it ends up being kind of small ball in, in a way. But oh, see, that was a sports metaphor, right? Oh, 
we're going to talk about that later. More to come later. Um, But um, I I do think that, uh, as we say, you know, it was a really popular measure when Stephen Harper brought it in. And uh, I can see why the Liberals are uh, uh, bringing it forward. And uh, we will see, of course, I mean, there's a long way between now and the next election. So we'll see um, what comes of it. Two and a half years. Okay, on to your column, my column. All right, it's time now for the regular feature we call Your Column, My Column, in which JMM and I reminisce about the columns that we wrote for the TVO website over this past week. JMM, what struck your fancy? Well, so we've actually already heard this uh, phrase in one of the clips that we used earlier, uh, but uh, I wrote a bit about the liberal housing policy announcement that we've already uh, talked about, uh, but uh, Bonnie Crombie has been using a phrase a lot lately, an abundance agenda. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I think the the use of that phrase and uh, some of the liberals who I've spoken to about it uh, – you know, tell me this is going to be uh, re- the, the really central lens that uh, they view all of their policy development uh, through over the next few years. And so I think it tells us a bit about where she is taking the Liberal Party. Um, you know, when she won uh, the Liberal leadership race, I don't think you necessarily, and, and uh, you know, this is not like a knock against her. I think it's natural that you didn't have like a ton of clarity about uh, all of her policy ambitions because that's not how leadership races go generally. Um, but uh, I think th- there's some interesting stuff happening in, in sort of uh, inside the, the the liberal party and, and it's it's uh, uh, movement if, you, if I can use the, that mm-hmm. word um, and and what they what they really want the, their next shot at government to be uh, and you know she talks about wanting affordable housing but not just affordable housing but like uh, really accessible education and healthcare and and these things as a, 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 it, frankly like, not too different from some of the themes that Doug Ford has talked about, but you can see this disagreement over fourplexes really tells you you can go a lot of different ways with the idea of abundance. Mm-hmm. So, Gotcha. An yeah. abundance agenda. The abundance agenda is a phrase you are going to be hearing a lot of from the liberals over the next little bit. Good. Uh, what about yourself, Steve? I want to talk about this guy. And that button's more than 40 years old. That's from an election campaign more than four decades ago for a, a candidate in Eglinton riding by the name of Roy McMurtry. Uh, first, it was Brian Mulrooney, and now this week, the death of another Tory titan. I guarantee you, look, I have no, I have no poll to base this on other than my own. I think I'm right about this. Ask 99 out of 100 Ontarians today who is the Attorney General of the province, and I don't think they're going to come up with Doug Downey's name. No offense to him, it's just a different time. Yep. Four decades ago, if you asked the same question, I guarantee you a lot of people would have known that the Attorney General in the province of Ontario was a guy named Roy McMurtry. He was the AG from 1975 to 85, 10 years. And people knew his name because he was involved in a hell of a lot of controversial issues. In fact, he got the nickname Roy McHeadline (laughs) because his name was in the paper so often in the headlines uh, related to controversial issues. I'll give you a couple here. I mean, he cared a great deal about hockey. He played hockey into his 50s, and he really loved the sport. And this was at a time in the middle 1970s when... The Broad Street Bullies, as the Philadelphia Flyers were then known, won a couple of Stanley Cups by playing, let's call it what it was, goon hockey. I mean, just out-and-out fights and mayhem and goonery. And the Flyers came to Maple Leaf Gardens for one game, and it got so out of hand that McMurtry had the cops lay charges against a couple of members of the Philadelphia Flyers because what they did was, frankly, I think his line at the time was, if you tried that off the ice, never mind on the ice, you'd be charged with assault. So, needless to say, the papers had a great time with that one. There was another occasion. Let me tell you something. If you go into the justice system of the province of Ontario today, you can get a trial in French if French is your first language because of Roy McMurtry. And the way he brought that policy in was fascinating. He didn't tell the premier. Bill Davis was the premier. He didn't tell him. He just unilaterally announced it without going through cabinet and without going through his premier. Can you imagine that today? No, (laughs) you can't. But Mr. McMurtry believed that it was the right thing to do. And I remember him telling me, there's no way I'd be able to get this through cabinet. So I just did it. And I thought if the premier wants to fire me, he can. But I don't think he will. Uh, And he didn't. And in fact, we have now a bilingual court system, thanks to Roy McMurtry's political courage, which, as Mr. Davis would have said, definitely tested the core of the Tory party. But there it is. He got it done. Now, I mean, that uh, uh, window of his career as attorney general, that certainly was a, a tumultuous time in terms of like constitutional negotiations. I have to assume he had a big role there. Massive and a- absolutely true. Um, 
Remember 1980, Pierre Trudeau comes back after that interregnum where he was out of power for a little while. He comes back pledging to repatriate the Constitution with an accompanying Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Big constitutional conference negotiations in Ottawa in the Government Conference Center in late 1981, I think. And, and the lore goes, I mean, it's uh, as with all lore, it's not 100% <laughs> true, but it's a great story. The lore goes that the three... Three big attorneys general of the country at that time, Jean Chrétien for the feds, Roy McMurtry for Ontario, Roy Romano for Saskatchewan, got together in a little kitchenette in the government conference center and essentially discussed and hammered out an agreement which turned out to be ultimately what we went for, right? Repatriated constitution with a charter. And, uh, and what was amazing about those guys was Jean Chrétien, liberal from rural Quebec, Romano, New Democrat from Saskatchewan, McMurtry, uh, kind of landed gentry, you know, Upper Canada College, University of Toronto, progressive conservative from Ontario. Yeah. They all had nothing personally in common other than a love of Canada. And to use the parlance of today, they got it done. Uh, Mr. McMurtry uh, went on to become the highest ranking judge in the province of Ontario. He was the chief justice of the highest court. One of his most historic decisions was legalizing gay marriage in the province of Ontario. He was a huge presence in Bill Davis's government, and I, out of the blue, just by dumb luck, called him about two and a half weeks ago, and I said, uh, can I come over and talk to you about something? I wanted to get his opinion about the like-minded judges stuff that's uh, going on right now. Right. And he did tell me, not for publication, but what the hell, I'm going to tell you now. He was very much opposed to it, and he did not like the idea. Right. But I went over to visit him. Turned out he died a week and a half after my visit, and so I, you know, just had this picture taken of the two of us, did a little selfie here, yeah. which I'm really glad I have as a, as a memento to that last visit that we had. We had numerous visits over the years. I really uh, enjoyed going over to talk to him and see him because I love the old stories and he loved to tell them. <laughs> Roy McMurtry was 91 years old and a real legend. And one of the only bits of trivia that I know about uh, McMurtry that he's actually one of, the, I think, either the only or one of the only uh, people to ever hold both the Attorney General and Solicitor General posts at the same time. Not only is that true, but he's also one of two people in 156 years of Ontario history to have been both Attorney General and Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Ontario. Two people, him and Dana Porter who you may, you may know his son, Julian Porter. Oh. Julian Porter. Yeah. Married to Anna Porter, the author. Anyway, his dad, Julian Porter's dad, Dana Porter, in the 40s and 50s, was also Attorney General, Chief Justice of the High Court. So he's in pretty select company, that Roy McMurtry. He sure was. Uh, and with that, we are going to go to the mailbag. Okay, you know our email address. It's on politics at tvo.org. We like getting your emails and your questions and comments. Start us off this week, JMM. Here is a question from listener Pratik Sarma, who lives on the Danforth in Toronto. Uh, Solidarity EastEnders. <laughs> uh, Pratik writes, uh, Hi, on politics podcast team. I'm a longtime listener, first-time writer. Here, here. I was wondering if you could give us an explainer on why different levels of government are allowed to have completely different levels of debt. Ah. I don't understand why cities can't be in the red while our provinces are always in the red and no one cares. Uh, some people care. The finance minister <laughs> cares. Uh, meanwhile, the federal government gets constantly called out for being in the red. Please explain. Thank you in advance. Sincerely, Pratik Sarma. Okay, that one's got your name all over it. Go ahead. Take a stab at it. Right. So municipalities can incur some debts, but uh, only for uh, generally capital projects, right? Uh, they still need to balance their operating budget every year, and they aren't allowed to assume debt to pay for uh, regular expenses over the long term. And there, there are also limits to just how much debt they're allowed to accrue uh, overall. So just if you aren't hip to operating in capital budget lingo, um, the, the analogy here would be if the province of Ontario was allowed to take on debt to build hospitals, but was not allowed to go into debt to pay nurses and doctors. Um, so uh, that's basically the rule that we impose on municipalities. The provincial government imposed these rules on municipalities. Uh, it's a legacy of the Great Depression when uh, not just municipalities, but in some provinces were uh, flirting with bankruptcy. Um, and so it is uh, designed to keep municipalities from going into bankruptcy, the kind of thing that we saw south of the border with Detroit, which is, I believe, the largest municipal bankruptcy uh, in that country's history uh, not too long ago. Hmm. And the feds and the provinces are allowed to go into debt for operational purposes because? Uh, because the Constitution 
doesn't say they can't. Basically, <laughs> uh, we have uh, you know inherited a system where we basically let uh, the federal and provincial governments do uh, anything that they are not outright prohibited from, uh, and that includes. It can spend into a uh, deficit, but municipalities, as we've uh, said several times, uh, they are creatures of the province. They only have the powers that provincial law gives them. And so the, the province in its uh, wisdom has uh, uh, imposed these controls on municipalities. Gotcha. Um, okay. I love this next one. Here is an email from a listener named Stuart Cowan, and it is a continuation of the story that I told, God, was it four years ago or four weeks ago? It feels like a long time ago. A continuation about this story about the demolition of the West Toronto Railway Station, which did take place four decades ago. And viewers have been adding to this story week after week after week after week. So I think it's kind of adorable, it's, actually. It's wonderful. Yeah. So here's Stuart writing, saying, Stephen JMM, one additional fact to share, if you can tolerate more train lore. While walking through the junction today, I passed a mural that I have seen hundreds of times. This time, it caught my attention. It depicts the very CPR West Toronto Rail Station that was demolished in 1982. Attached is a picture of the mural located on the northwest corner of Dundas Street and Pacific Avenue. You will see that the artist has added the label West Toronto Station in the top left. So while the building may be gone, the memory of this CPR rail station lives on, albeit in mural form. This may close the book on this rail tale. Cheers, Stuart Cowan from Toronto. That is fabulous. I hope it doesn't close the, the chapter on it. Uh, I guess we should note that the destruction of this station, along with a few others, eventually led to the creation of the Heritage Railway Stations Protection Act of 1985. That's a federal law that requires government approval for any changes made to an existing station. Yeah, I, I also hope this is not the uh, uh, end of people sending in uh, lovely uh, uh, tips and facts about uh, trains. Um, we have learned quite a bit from our listeners and uh, and our viewers, and uh, I really think that's wonderful. Um, it's and you know again, who doesn't love being able to explain the interaction between municipal and provincial and federal laws? Exactly, we live for it. Yeah, the uh, <laughs> you know it's a shame that that building was uh, destroyed, but uh, it, it has lived on in this podcast now. <laughs> right on. Right on. Uh, one final email from listener Brian Lewis, who writes, did I really see JMM use a sports metaphor in a oh, recent article on shocking. TVO.org? Shocking. I'm reading an article entitled, Once Again, the Tories Committed an Unforced Error Before Conceding the Inevitable. Isn't unforced error a tennis term? <laughs> if Steve ever needs someone to come on the show and talk about the Hamilton Tiger Cats or the provincial economy, I'm your guy. <laughs> Keep up the great work on the On Poly podcast. I'm wondering, is that the same Brian Lewis who used to be a referee in the National Hockey League? I'm wondering, because I know a Brian Lewis who used to be a referee in the NHL and who I believe was a municipal counselor in one of the municipalities in the GTA. I want to say Milton, I think. I wonder if that's him. I don't know. Matthew, find out, and then we'll, we'll <laughs> confirm next week. Uh, anyway, Brian, thanks for those kind words. And JMM, I am delighted. No, I am beyond delighted that my obsession with sports seems to be finally rubbing off that much on you. Well, I mean, I, I don't mean to disappoint you or Brian, but <laughs> the dirty little secret is I did not write that headline. Oh, <laughs> breaking my heart, kid. Breaking I did understand it, but <laughs> I did not write it. All right. On politics at TVO.org. I'm yes. going to say the email this week because whenever I ask you to say it in the past, you always kind of scratch your I, head and say... I flub it, and I can never remember. It's, my brain is not wired to remember that email address for some reason. On politics at TVO.org. There we go. Okay. Good stuff. <laughs> All right. That is the On Poly podcast for this March 22nd, 2024. You can follow our show on Apple Podcasts so that you get notified each time a new episode is available. And if you already follow our show, help a friend follow it too. Any feedback you have, we're happy to hear it, good, bad, or indifferent. I'm going to give the email again. On politics at TVO.org. Be sure to include your first and last name and where you're located. This week's episode was produced and edited by Matthew O'Mara, video editing by Colin Kish. Production support from Jonathan Hallowell, Christine Gardner, Vito Tagarelli, Jeff Cosera, and Jennifer DeRosa. Our managing editor is Katie O'Connor. Lori Few is the executive producer of Digital. John Ferry is vice president of programming and content. We always like to thank the studio crew here for making not only our audio podcast look so nice in video on Friday nights on the agenda. So thanks so much, everybody, for that. And just a reminder, next week, budget special. Budget special next Friday for the podcast. So make sure you tune in for that. And with that, we say bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>